Welcome to another episode of the Bakari Sellers Podcast. Today, I got a special guest. He's just dope, to say the least, all around good brother, but none other than Michael Bennett, man. How you doing today, man? I'm doing good, man. Just, you know, America's very interesting right now. Everything that's happening, got the metaverse happening. We got all kinds of stuff. I'm about to start marching for the real world. It's just like the real world is about to disappear, you know? So <laughs> if you enjoy the real world, people might look at you wrong, you know? It's like, it's like a video game is happening right before our eyes. Man, that's crazy. That's a good insight, though. Well, you know, on this show, we start each one of our episodes by having our guests kind of walk us through the arc of your career. But obviously, knows everyone knows Michael Bennett, the future Hall of Fame defensive end. But to borrow the line from your book, you're also an activist, a feminist, a grassroots philanthropist, an organizer, and a change maker. Talk about the experiences that helped shape how you got to this point. And have you always been this outspoken about race and justice issues, or was this just this an orientation that happened over time? I think I've always kind of been that way. I think uh, all my family went to historically black colleges. So I spent a lot of time at Grambling University in Southern. Uh, in my summers, like NAACP camps, and we, we, we would be trying to do sports. I remember running into Eddie Robinson and uh, Doug Williams. Like, so early on, I was, you know, I was learning about our history. My mom was a teacher too. So, uh, Black history was a part of everything in my family. And like the struggle of, 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 of being Black and, and being Black, obviously, you see a lot of different things. And so, from a young age, uh, my grandma, you know, she, she, you know, I got my moosey, she, she 80 and she's still talking shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, she, <laughs> like, exactly. you know, she right there with a cigarette right there. What y'all talking about that you know back in like So like, so it's like, I've been around a whole bunch of, I would say that truth telling is something or being able to uh, uh, talk about or articulate what you see has been a part of my family history for a long period of time. Um, I think it's embedded in my DNA, right? Because when I was uh, a couple of years back, I, um, I was doing my DNA and work with African ancestry, which is a lot different from all the other uh, DNA programs. They kind of just tell you it's sub-Saharan, all these different things, but African DNA, um, African ancestry, it goes into your African ancestry and tells you what tribe you're from. It's just so happy that I came from a tribe of, of uh, called the Mandika. Obviously people know who the Mandika is, but from, in Senegal. Um, and uh, one thing in, in our, history and our thing was is about griots and and the griot is a storyteller a or storyteller that's or right or mm-hmm. story about truth and that was already in my dna you know a warrior storyteller this was so i it's like it's woven inside of me so it's not me it's the people that came before me and i'm just a you know standing on their shoulders right and um i remember being in senegal in dakar and i was in i went to visit the tribe and wanted to see all these different things in africa it's kind of like you know, 2017, I believe. Um, and I was there and I was just standing at the point of no return and and in there. And I don't know a lot of people have been to Gory Island and I've been at the point of return, but as an African American person, it's a different experience. You know, I was I seen a lot of people from Europe there, right? There was a lot of people from Europe in that point, and they were taking pictures of that, like, oh, we're here, you know, it was like it's Instagrammable. But for me, it was really more emotional, right? Because I was I had tears coming down my eyes, the emotion of this is where my ancestors left this area and never returned. And so I think full circle back, it's like, this has always been in my DNA. I think um, all, those, all, all those different moments, whether it was when I was a child or when it was you know, my mom or history or running into different people or taking a knee, all these different things, um, they, they were already you know, a part of who I was. And I think there's definitely been moments that kind of shaped my, um, historical uh, view of it, right? Having a more sense of understanding and history, history of people who came before, having a better understanding of the uh, people that are living now. Um, definitely, you know, I look back at um, the incident what happened with James Byrd back in Jasper. Uh-huh. Um, you know, obviously George Floyd touched a lot of people, Trayvon Martin. Um, There's one particular situation in Seattle that really kind of shaped me, right? It was right before when it was like, say her name was happy. It was like right before there was a lady named Charlene Lyles who called the police and she was murdered in her, in her home. And um, all those things kind of shaped me to realize that there's, um, that it's not so much about uh, individuals or it's, it's not so much about even being black, right? It's really about humanity. And I think 
that's the thing that often gets lost in translation in these conversations. We often have a, a battle of right or wrong, and we actually have a battle of all these different things when at the core of it all, it's about a loss of human, a loss of humanity, a loss of opportunity. And I think that's where, um, as I grow older, and, and that's kind of what I think about a lot. What are the issues now that keep you busy and what organizations are you working with in your kind of in your post NFL days? Um, so, you know, during 2020, I, spent, I don't hate to talk about I hate talking about plans because I know there's somebody listening that wants to crumble the plan. But um, you you protect it and you big enough and strong enough and you got the protection that they, you know, they won't no, be able to, if it's meant for you, they won't be able to they won't be able to crumble it. So basically, I spent a lot of time um, in 2020 kind of more studying Booker T. Washington and uh, about having the opportunity to, you know, back in the day, they were really building an army of like creativity, right? This idea of like being able to create and having a pipeline of creativity, of owning and doing and building our own stuff. You know, like when I look at uh, cities and I look at the way the cities are planned, it's like, there's not enough black people. Like when you think about architects in America, so than 2%, of black architects in the business. And we talk about design, we start talking about industrial design, all these different things. So um, I spent a lot of time studying Booker T, looking at W. Du Bois, studying the talented 10, just kind of uh, looking back and uh, doing this and reading about uh, Melvin Mitchell. You know, he has a book, it's called, uh, what is it called? It's called The Crisis of African American Architects. It's a historical process. So um, I've been, um, I went back to school to study. Uh, architecture and just studying design does understand a deeper dis, uh, understanding of how uh, you know we can help create and um, build within our own cities and um, build a, another thing outside of the social construct that's already being built and have are you art. is also is architecture your future or your next step or are you going to be out here ske sketching out communities and cities etc I, I, I think it's more from a I, I really like so I'm back in school for architecture right now like I'm doing which is yeah uh going to school for architecture when you have a busy schedule is it's hard boy it's like it's a lot <laughs> it's super busy bro I'm like always building models and I'm always drawing and like I have a whole board back there like that's a, see. a yeah a drafting board you know like so um yeah I think there's this uh there's a whole bunch of holes in the system that I think when we look at uh, African Americans in the future of what I think that is important. I think uh, having more people in the medical field, obviously education, and also people in the design field. I think the design is when you look back in time, even at Thomas Jefferson and Monticello, you look at all these different things, like those are African American people who design those things. So like the rooted, we look back at Africa and we look at the pyramids or we look at all these things that were being built. We had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of identity and we created a lot of those things. So I think just being able to build is part of what I've been working on right now. I recently have been working with the Royal Island School of Design. I'm um, working on something with them to get more African-Americans and people of color opportunities to um, get that type of workload and have an understanding of working in, in that type of a built environment versus being books, but more about being hands-on learning and helping create. So that's what I've been working on a lot around design and um, stuff like that. That's pretty amazing, man. You found a gap where we needed more representation and you filled it. Let's talk about your activism and kind of post Kaepernick NFL activism. You've been a voice in the NFL community for a very long period of time. And we saw how poorly the country and the NFL responded to Colin. So my question is, do you think the NFL has learned anything from how it fucked up its response to Colin Kaepernick and what should they have learned? I think I think they did learn a lot. I think they learned that there's a that that as much as you want to, you know, rip the fabric of identity from your players and you know, there's a facade that's created um, that because you're an NFL that these things don't happen to you. And I think I think the NFL learned that that's not true, that a lot of their players are still connected to their communities and their players want to have a voice and they're looking for guidance to how to articulate their voice. You know, I had a conversation with Roger Goodell and I told Roger Goodell, I said, look, Roger, you know, um, when you think about football, you think about a lot of people play football and it became like a refuge for them to get away from certain things. It built up uh, a certain uh, energy for their city and respect for their community. 
And now when you get to NFL, there's so much capitalism that's involved with it. There's a disconnect. There's a child that is looking for the player to have a voice, not just in the sense of selling them the latest Nike, but also in the sense of like giving them strength. You know, I think that's what Colin Kaepernick did. He gave young people the opportunity to say, oh, I'm not just an athlete. I'm more than an athlete. I'm still in that from LeBron, the more than an athlete thing. But I'm sure that's what Colin was thinking about was that he's more than yeah, an athlete. Sure. Right? I got to give LeBron James his credit because I think LeBron James, I don't know to get off topic, but I think LeBron James is probably the greatest athlete to uh, to live really in this sense of, I mean, of course, there's Craig Hodges and there's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and there's Tommy Davis and Tommy. But uh, transcend Tommy. transcend sports at the highest level. Transcend sports. There's John Carlos, right? But then I think LeBron James was the first person to be in a, the seat of Michael Jordan and still understand that there's a connection to community. He still uses his voice. Everything that he's doing is all about. You know, how can we raise that up? He hasn't ran from that. Um, he hasn't ran from that responsibility. In some ways, he's actually taken the torch of Kaepernick and made it more useful. I mean, not that Kaepernick didn't do, but I think LeBron was able to take that on as being the greatest Black athlete on the planet and being able to have his messages. But I think the NFL um, definitely is trying to improve it. But I also think the way that they try to improve it sometimes it just has to be authentic. And I think that's where they're looking for, that authentic connection between the, the Black community and 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 uh, and the struggle and organizing. And they're trying to make steps. I think it's more about uh, giving more people of color. But I also think the biggest thing that we haven't really talked about, right? Because my grandma always says this, charity starts at home. And I think about one thing that we haven't really looked at about the NFL is about Black coaches and Black leadership in that facility. And I think black that's ownership. one thing. That, black ownership, yeah. right? Not that, I mean, ownership is really hard because there's only like Kanye West is, you know, hypothetically the richest black man in America. That's what I mean. That's what it says on paper. I don't know if that's true or not. But that's no, Rob, Robert Robert Smith is the richest black man in America. But yeah, yeah Kanye, I, I hear what Kanye say. Yeah, Kanye is saying that he's he's worth six billion. I don't know Robert Smith. Yeah, so I know Robert Smith is actually has the he's actually has the cash. You know, so <laughs> you know, you know the evaluations rock the nations. If I do say, it, you know, what I'm saying, and um, <laughs> but I think um, you know finding a way to you know also talk about the idea of having more opportunities for black coaches, more opportunity for black front office, more black opportunities in all those spaces. I think. That's a conversation that the NFL hasn't had publicly. And I think that's something that we're also talking about what's going on in the world. It's also a time to self-reflect. And I think a lot of times in America, well, people don't like to self-reflect because self-reflection obviously shows you your true self. You know, there's no makeup, there's no nothing. It's just you in the mirror. And I think the self-reflection of the NFL is also its commitment to its outer realm of people, but also its commitment to its coaches and black players. A lot of the black players eventually want to become coaches. And I think if we don't take on that battle too, as much as we're taking on these other battles, then we're not going to have a place in that realm either. That makes perfect sense. To walk us through and take us through, you know, during that time of protest with Eric Reed and Colin Kaepernick, not at the beginning, but kind of when it popped, because they were they were kneeling before anybody actually paid attention to it. Yeah. But when it popped off, talk about the, the Seahawk locker room. And how was it at that time? And what, what role did you play in getting folks to think about the protest the right way? And what was un, what was unfolding right around them? I think a lot of it was, I think at the beginning, a lot of people didn't have the historical context to understand about, uh, just about his history, the historical context of, of struggle and the historical uh, context of protest over a long period of time, whether it was uh, John Carlos, whether it was whoever it was in that time, they didn't know much about it, right? Even as being African-American person, for some reason, they made it just skip that class. I mean, maybe they just skipped that class or maybe their mom didn't talk about it. Um, so it was a lot of interesting thing, right? Because I think in some ways, a lot of people were affected by the idea of, of capitalism. Um, like how do, well, if I do this, I'm gonna lose my, I'm gonna lose this. And I think it was a lot of about sacrifice. And I think, um, even in Bible, it talks about, you know, I remember there's a conversation between Jesus and John the Baptist, and he says, uh, you know, John is thinking that, you know, he's going to get baptized by Jesus, and Jesus says, no, uh, no, you're going to baptize me, and then John's asking him a question, and he's talking and talking, and Jesus says, you know, uh, sacrifice 
And perseverance is how you reach righteousness. And I think a lot of times in that conversation that we were having, a lot of people weren't really wanting to sacrifice this, this earthly things, right? Because all these things that we're fighting is, is, is spiritual, right? It's a spiritual thing. There's some things that go beyond the flesh and it goes on to the spiritual realm of like how we should be building our legacy. And I think legacy is spiritual, right? Because it's the legacy is a spirit that continues to live long below beyond the flesh. And those conversations were really tough because it's hard to tell young people or young guys about the movements and why we should be coordinated together and how, you know, if we're if all moving together as a strength, how much powerful our words will be. So the conversation were really heavy. We had a lot of conversation, a lot of white players, they just didn't get it, right? Because they never ever really lived in our shoes. <clears throat> and they see us, they see some of us wearing Rolex, they see some of us having Rolls Royces. So they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, okay. <laughs> they don't understand that, but they're not understanding that we're just one, one false move from being Right judge, once false move from being killed or a cousin being killed like all of us have been connected with some type of police violence all of us have been connected to some type of racism and all of us are are connected to the past and the history and we all know that america was birthed off the bosom of, of black women right and 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 black everything right if without without Amer without blackness feeding america that baby doesn't grow right and this country doesn't become what it is and i think when we look back at that there's a lot of grief and a lot of grievance that, you know, white people don't really want to talk about. And in that locker room, a lot of people didn't want to talk about it. Even the coaches, man, I remember going, getting so mad. I'm like, but you a black coach, my brother. Like, I get that. We're going to win this game. And this is just, just a game. There's a game of life that we have to um, really get into that this is not for us. It's for our kids. What if, what if, you know, Harry Tubman was like, nah, I'm free. Oh, fuck everybody else. Like, you yeah, I better get to the north on your own then that's the problem, you know what I'm saying? This idea that, you know, when you go to Africa and you look at a lot of different things, African-American people are very tribal. And, and that way we build, we're part of tribes. Like we do things together. And it's like those type of movements have to be done together. We look at SNCC, we look at King, we look at everybody. It's like everybody that was a part of movements and the historical movements. If we look at Patrice Lumumba, we look at, you know, this, uh, uh, Stephen Biko, we look at Nelson Mandela. These are movements that are, are moved by a group of people that keep, that, that one person may be the face of it, but it's a, it's a it's an, it's an ideology, right? And it's the ideology that we're trying to share within the locker room that it was just tough conversations. And Pete Carroll, unfortunately, I would say Pete was pretty open. I think as a white coach, I think Pete was pretty open to listening because he had been in South Central. He had been in a lot of places. Oh, yeah. But the other coaches, they were kind of like, I, you know, no, what about the game? It's like, nah, it's not about, it's not about the military. It's like, but if we look at historical, look at the military, there's been issues in the military with African-American people. There's conversations with Thurgood Marshall and what happened with, when the bomb exploded in the Navy. Like there's a whole bunch of different conversations that happen and putting us in situations that we were educated on, putting us in places that they knew what would happen. And those, and so it's a lot of things they don't want to go into, but it's a lot of things that's the history of African Americans in the military, even after the civil, even after the Civil War. Like we fought and like, okay, like, what's up? What's up? What's up? What's up with our king? You know, American Revolution. Like, okay, look, okay, you tell us, you know, not to fight against the British because we're going, you know what I'm saying? And we're going to become free and like, oh yeah, oh yeah, you know, yeah, um, wait, oh, Benjamin Franklin. Oh yeah, you know that one part that we wrote? That that wasn't technically for y'all. That was for us. Like you're still in the property thing. So I think there's a lot of history that a lot of people don't know that why these movements are important. And in that locker room made no different. It was just that it were tough conversations because you, we, as a team, you know, winning is important. But I also think uh, creating legacy is more important than winning at the moment. It's it's the it's the idea of not being caught up in a moment, but being, you know, caught up in a movement. The idea of not winning just the battle, but the idea of winning the war. And I think that's what we were having a big issue at. So Sorry, you, you, you No, know, you're good. No, that's that's good. I, I trust me, I ain't cutting you off. You 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 were giving my listeners a bunch of knowledge, but we all need let me ask you this. What in the back to the locker room, I mean, were you having conversation? It feels like things have changed so rapidly. Were you guys having yeah. mental health conversations like they are now? Yeah. I mean I'm thinking about your brother Everson Griffin right now and everything that he went is going through. I mean, are those were those conversations that were had in the locker room, or was you know, it still stigmatized? I think it was still stigmatized. I think, I think being just black in America is, is traumatic. It's a mental health thing. Like, 
even you having to tell your children that they were once slaves, right? Or once this or once that. And I think even in the NFL, I think nobody really talk about mental health, right? Right? Because mental health is a form of saying, oh, I'm weak. But it's not really about being weak. It's about being very vulnerable and open to uh, about conversations about how you're really feeling and being connected. And I think also as the Black man, over the look at history, we were never allowed, really allowed to have that, right? Because we have to do certain things and like you, you have to build up you know, this box to not have certain feelings because the world is so cruel and the world is so tough that, you know, if you can build a sense of callous around your body, you won't be able to feel and you can become numb. But if you become numb so long, you just stop feeling and not having feelings can make life a lot more harsh. It can make you, you know, Mm -hmm. your kids are talking to you and this harshness is controlling you. And I think in the NFL, you, it's like any other pain that you have, it's always masked. I think we all always are, are, are masked. You know? I think about the, the poem, Paul Robes, and we wear the mask, you know, like those things, um, um, it's, uh, it's mental health is an, another way of, you know, wanting us to continue to cover the mask. And I think ever since, you know, he's had a couple of issues, a couple episodes I know in the past, uh, and I pray for him too, like you said, right? I pray that he heal, I pray that he heal soon, you know, because it's it's tough when you live in this out in the middle of the world and you look at- And everybody it, sees it, yeah. And everybody sees it and it's like, nah, man, people go through these things. It's like, there's a point of life where, you know, money and, and everything is, isn't enough. It's like, you know, the thing about, you know, wounds, like, right? It, like some wounds like flesh through wounds can be seen right flesh through wounds are the easiest wounds to spot because oh well, you have a scar right there you have a cut right there oh you got a cut right there but spiritual wounds you can't hit you can't see because they cut so deep into the soul that none of us can really have you know unless we in tune with you and we can see your pain we don't know what you experience we only can see the outer shell of you we don't know what's going on with you on the inside i think everson griffin's conversation we don't know what's what has happened to him to make him feel that way we want to say, well, you got money, you got success, you got everything, but we don't know what truly is haunting him or what he needs to be helped. And I think, um, you know, at some point, the things that make us comfortable, we have to become uncomfortable. And that's pretty much what my book is about too. I talked about, you know, being uncomfortable in mental health and how as an athlete, you know, you slowly pull away from your identity as a young child. I think even myself, when I think about sports, and I think about mental health, I think about like, damn, my earliest relationship with sports was always been an exploited relationship. It's never really been, uh, it's like when you're a black kid, playing sports is not like a fun thing. Like it is fun, right? But you may not see the bigger picture of like, of what other people are trying to do, right? It, they're, you like Pinocchio, they're, they're, they're playing you, right? You're like, oh, you fast. It's like, Oh, I can't make it, but we'll pay for you, mama, to have a house. We'll pay for you to eat pizza. Oh, you run, get whoever runs the fastest gets this. It's like there's this communication of transaction that's happening a lot that you don't even realize that those transactions are slowly eating away at the core of who you really are. And I think um, as mental health, that's another thing is that relationship with athletes is not knowing who they are or not knowing how to articulate how they're feeling because everything about them is how good they play or how well they do something. And it's, it's never about emotions, it's more about transactional emotions. And I think about a lot of athletes, a lot of times I look at a lot of athletes, more athletes cry when they win a Super Bowl than when somebody in their family died or when they win or <laughs> when they baby were born. Like they're so connected to that in that way that that is the most emotional moment that they will ever, ever have, right? And that's kind of sad when you think about it, right? And you think about like, damn, like winning this thing that you can only hold for a month and the, 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 the quest for it again starts right after that game. Like you don't even get a chance to really enjoy that. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's, that's my spiel. <laughs> I'm a, I got a couple more questions. I'm gonna get you out of here. You, you wrote a, a book entitled Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. Talk to me about the events around you at that time and what inspired you to write that book. And that title is probably one of the most pitch perfect titles I've ever I've ever heard. So talk to me about that process for real quick. Well, first of all, I was I, I was always loved Dick Gregory, man. and like when he wrote the book. I mean, I I, I think I was like I want to say I was fifteen when I first read that book. Um, I don't know. We can say the N word on here. But yeah, you that can was, say whatever you can say whatever you want to say on here. The the book the nigger right? It was like yeah. that book. I read that book early on and often. I mean, when I was a kid. And I often refer to it, and obviously, uh, uh, 
I think about that. Uh, Franz Ferdinand, Black Skin, White Mass. You know, um, you know these books and these 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 provocative titles that you know, like what is what is, what the fuck is this book really about? Like what the fuck is nigga about? You know, what I mean, what is that book about? You know, and then you go into it. It's like these deeper conversations and these um, the meanings of what does make white people uncomfortable, right? I think truth is one thing, history is another thing, you know? And I think this book was really about those things. Like these are like, this might make you uncomfortable to really understand the experience of a black athlete because you perceive a black athlete in a different context. And these 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 stories or, or my story or my feelings or what has happened was probably make you uncomfortable, but you need to hear this because Usually, in, in comfort is what in uh, comfort is where we don't grow, right? Uncomfortability is where we often grow, and it's like that's when we can have a chance to heal, right? And I think uncomfortability is also self reflection. And in this book, it was just like a self reflection of things that I've seen, right? I think it was a lot about you know, like what happened to me in Vegas, or being in the locker with my players, or the experiences that I had in college, and how those you know basically shaped me and like. You know, like, so it's like in my mom and just like this relationship and this whole thing is about the end of the book really, what I really think the whole, all of it really comes down to what makes white people uncomfortable is black humanity. And I hate to say that, that's it's not that I'm saying it, that everybody done that, but. No, it's not a generalization, but your point is, your point is very well made. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Black humanity is what is made America uncomfortable, and we could look at history. History tells us that over and over and over moments, every time that we scream for humanity, this is when you get uncomfortable and this is when things happen because our humanity is something that's constantly being pulled away from us. It's constantly, there's dividers. And that's what this book ultimately was about. It was like this, this the humanizing us in a way that's like, man, like I'm an athlete, but first I'm human, you know what I'm saying? like. There's no title becomes before human. And I think that's what we get so caught up is that we have so many titles that it's like, oh, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this CEO, I'm this, 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 that. I'm, look at goddamn Instagram. You look at everybody goddamn shit. At How, the highlight there. real. There, Instagram ain't nothing but, but sports center. You're a CEO of what? Uh, you got one customer. Like, <laughs> technically, I guess you're a CEO. But, you know, but there's so many titles that we forget. And it's like, Overall, I think I'm just, we're just human. And that was my whole thing is like, look, as much thing as I've been through and experienced, you may have questions about this, why I'm doing this, but at the end of the day, most people are fighting just for the humanities aspect of it all.